This is CBC Here and Now. Tonight, charges for conspiracy to commit murder. Police charged two men after an investigation involving multiple police forces. I'm really pleased. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm the local MHA as well as the minister, so this was important for me. There's work in there for everybody to do. There's items for government, there's items for the board, for the physicians, and for the communities. A scathing report says central health lacks vision. The review looked into what workers called a toxic work environment and low morale. So, what has to happen to turn things around? Big changes proposed for landlords and tenants. It values good tenants and good landlords and the relationship. And it's a modern act. It's a 2018 act. We'll have the details coming up on Here and Now. Two men were arrested last night for conspiring to commit a murder. And this is not their first brush with the law. Their alleged target, a man with past links to the Hells Angels. Here now is Jen White joins us live with the latest on this. Jen, what can you tell us about this case? Well, Dustin Etheridge and John Squires appeared in St. John's Provincial Court earlier this afternoon, and they were arrested last night for plotting to murder Bradley Summers over the past two months. They're also facing firearms charges for having a loaded handgun, and this is not their first time in the news. I'll start with the alleged target of the conspiracy, that's Bradley Summers. Five years ago, CBC News reported that he may have been trying to open a Hells Angels branch in St. John's. At the time, he was arrested after a joint police investigation into outlaw motorcycle gangs. He was charged with assault and uttering threats to cause death or bodily harm. The month before his arrest, he lived in a house on Hamilton Avenue that was firebombed. Now, one of the co-accused in this case is Dustin Etheridge. He was the subject of a recent CBC News investigation. And just five months ago, we learned that he was soliciting new clients for his moving company, Twin City Movers, while he was facing bribery and weapons charges. His company was actually posting new ads for the business while he was in custody. And the other co-accused in this case is John Squires. Now, he was charged with six weapon offenses in 2014 for having a sawed-off shotgun in his vehicle that was parked just across the street from the Froud Avenue Community Center. But the judge on that case ruled that the investigation violated Squires' rights and he walked free. Now, Etheridge and Squires are being held in custody and they're due back in court later this month. Meanwhile, Etheridge will also be before the courts again this summer on bribery and weapons charges. Anthony? That's Jen White reporting live from our newsroom. Central Health is under the microscope today as the results of an external report were made public. That review comes in the wake of complaints about hospital morale and, according to some staff, a toxic work environment. The reviewer was told that there is nobody with a vision and that there's absent leadership at all levels. One board member told him there was no common purpose. And many talked about the use of hurtful language and concerns about bias on many levels, including gender as well as race. Now, Dr. Peter Vaughn conducted Central Health's review. He's a former Deputy Minister of Health and Wellness in Nova Scotia with more than 35 years in the field. Vaughn interviewed 115 people in face-to-face -face interviews. He also received 178 confidential emails from the public, staff and physicians. His report makes more than 30 recommendations. It also details an unhealthy, long-standing rivalry between Grand Falls, Windsor, where corporate offices are located and the majority of staff live, and the Gander area. That report is now in the health minister's hands. I think it's just uh, a, a, lack of, a lack of clear knowledge of what's going on across the region. And as much about communication as anything else, there has been a historical rivalry between the two communities, which has you know, been in sport and various other things. Uh, but I don't really know whether this is reflective of the way the communities feel truly about each other. Well, over the past year, we've told you the horror stories. Landlords ripped off by tenants who destroyed their homes and tenants who were taken advantage of by greedy landlords. But today, the government put forward a whole new set of laws to replace the Residential Tenancies Act. Here now is Ryan Cook joins us with that story. Ryan, what are the big changes that are coming? Well, Debbie, it seems to be good news whether you're someone who is replying to a sign like this or you're someone who is posting the sign. Government says that they have plans to completely repeal the current legislation and replace it with something that's a little more fair to both sides.
the stories that we've heard in the media are, you know, uh, landlords out there with apartments that have been, you know, bed up, trashed, and uh, they're concerned, and they have costs associated with that. And then we've heard from tenants who felt that they were discriminated by the landlord, and so there's, there's a cost associated with that also. To get an idea of what this act looks like, let's revisit an old example. While Matt Doyle's apartment was being trashed, he struggled to find his tenants to serve them with eviction notices. And then he had to endure this process, full of opportunities to buy time. Well, the new bill eliminates a step from this chart and shaves 17 days off the whole process. It would also see notices served electronically. No more chasing someone who is trying to dodge you. And if you are in a situation like this, the new rules allow you to get a direct order to evict a tenant without notice or appeals, but only in extreme situations. That nature, being able to Sherwin Flight was consulted by the government on this bill. He runs a Facebook page where thousands of landlords and tenants go for advice. I think it's definitely uh, a lot of steps in the right direction. You know, there's still a little, little thing here and there that you know, we could probably fix up, but I'm happy with the, with the results overall. Flight was instrumental in pushing for a domestic violence policy. Victims of family violence will now be able to break a lease and not pay a penalty. At least now it gives those people in vulnerable situations a way to get out and you know, not have to worry about you know, either being in a dangerous situation or you know, being liable for paying rent at a place that's not safe for them to live. And there's really so much more in this act as well. Boarding houses are covered for the first time. Fees have been jacked up. And I don't know if you remember the CBC Investigate story about the hidden cameras in a rental unit. Well, I should go without saying, but you can't do that anymore either. Reporting live for Here Now in St. John's, I'm Ryan Cook. Wait times in our healthcare system. How about two years to see a neurologist or a psychiatrist? I'm in constant pain. I can't work. I can't do anything. That story ahead on Here and Now. A man accused of assaulting his live-in partner told the court today that actually he was the victim. Ray Newman, who was acquitted six years ago of murdering his estranged wife, Chrissy Predham Newman, he is now on trial for assaulting his former girlfriend last year in paradise. Here now's Glenn Payette reports. These are pictures of Nicole Young, Ray Newman's former girlfriend. She says the marks are because Newman assaulted her. But on the stand today, Newman said Young was a cocaine addict. And after they had argued when she tried to buy drugs in a bar, he had told her he had had enough. And he says she punched him in the face as they were about to drive home. He says he told her the relationship couldn't last because of her drug use. Newman says that when they got home, she left and he went to bed. He says he woke up with Young on top of him, punching him, and he had to push her off. Newman said it seemed silly, but she asked him why they couldn't get married. And he said, are you kidding? I don't want to be with you anymore. He says she left again. Newman says he was afraid she was going to come back, so he called the police. He says she did come back, but just got a blanket and slept in the truck until the next morning, and he went to work. The police didn't respond to Newman's call until 11 hours later. Despite the fact that it was Newman who called the police, he ended up being the one who got charged. The case is back in court June 1st. Glenn Payette, CBC News. St. John's. A provincial court judge has released an inmate from Her Majesty's Penitentiary because of how he was treated inside. Justin Jennings pleaded guilty to three assaults on other inmates, but his lawyer argued he had mental health issues made worse by his stay in prison. Jennings was put on antidepressants during an assessment at the Waterford Hospital, but the prison psychiatrist took him off those medications. The judge ruled that prison officials were aware of Jennings' deteriorating mental state, but put him into the special handling unit unit called the shoe where he became agitated and attacked other inmates. The judge ruled those conditions justified a sentence of time served. A former businessman in Happy Valley Goose Bay is going to jail for sexual assault. 78 year old Warwick Pike has been sentenced to six months behind bars and two years probation. He was found guilty on two counts of sexual assault and one count of sexual interference. The crimes involve a single victim dating back to 1996.
turning our attention for a brief moment now at, uh, with Ryan to have a look at the weather. Another gorgeous, gorgeous day. Yes, a uh, little on the cool side as we've been watching mm -hmm. uh, uh, temperatures drop, but not a bad day for watching whales. True, some big visitors came our way. These are humpbacks and they're starting to arrive. These pictures were taken by Ashley George and these whales were feeding just off Dildo. Nice. Isn't that great? They're coming early. The it's definitely early. Icebergs, maybe the cave line will be in early. That's right. It's it all feeling good. Absolutely. Took till July last year, of course, uh, for the uh, Cape line to arrive. So hopefully uh, this is a sign they'll arrive a little earlier this season. Oh, that's a fantastic nice shot. Tips. All right. So everybody looking forward to the weekend. Maybe you're planning to do some whale watching or some iceberg hunting. And uh, in terms of the forecast, we are talking about, again, some showers to watch for, but also some sun in the mix. Here's a quick rundown of what to expect. So showers along that cold front will sweep through eastern Newfoundland through this evening into the overnight. Friday's looking pretty quiet as this area of high pressure takes over and that will lead into a pretty nice looking Saturday as well. But we'll see a late day arrival with this system into western Labrador. It spreads into Happy Valley Goose Bay by Sunday morning on the doorstep of southwestern parts of Newfoundland and that rain will march from southwest to northeast across Saint, across uh, Newfoundland, finally into the St. John's region, into the mid to late afternoon on Sunday. So Sunday's generally just a cloudy day for eastern Newfoundland. Those showers will arrive earlier uh, for you folks in Central and, of course, the West Coast. And into Labrador, we're talking about possibility of some snow mixing in with those showers. And then we're clearing out on Monday. Still a chance of some lingering showers and flurries as we roll into that holiday Monday time period. We'll see if we can get that fire under control on the grill. And we'll have, of course, uh, another outlook at this. And, of course, your full weather forecast details coming up in a few minutes. The RNC released its strategic plan for the next three years. It's big on community partnerships, dealing more appropriately with people with mental health illnesses, and new strategies to combat drugs and addiction issues. But it's also a reminder that all is not well with the force. Here now's Terry Roberts was following this story today, and he's outside RNC headquarters with more. Terry? Well, yes, Debbie, uh, Chief Joe Bolin really spelled out really the seven strategic goals for the force over the next year. And as you mentioned, a lot of talk about uh, building more community partnerships, but also uh, he really emphasized the fact that there's still a lot of work to do when it comes to police responding to people who are going through a mental health crisis. He called it the greatest challenge facing the force. Now, Chief Bolin said there's still, you know, there's been a lot of uh, work done, a lot of uh, strides have been made in recent years. And he singled out the establishment of a combined mental health crisis team that also includes uh, mental health experts. Now, as such, he says police responses to mental health related situations, they're very much different than they, than they were in the past. We're not having to go into people's homes now and arrest people and take them out in handcuffs and search them and put them in the back of police cars and show up at hospitals treating people like they're criminals. Now we're going in, the interaction is done in the home. They can diagnose them in the home. They can do referrals from within the home. Now I spoke to uh, quite a few mental health advocates who are here at this uh, meeting today and they had a lot of positive things about the way that the RNC has changed its approach to mental health. Now Chief Bolin also uh, emphasized the fact that there's going to be a shift as well in another area. That's when it comes to the illegal drug trade and also issues such as addictions. He says it's the number two issue facing the uh, uh, RNC and he says there will be a shift right now to what, to what he says are the street level crimes. Just listen to what he had to say. Some of the some of the flaws that you're seeing now are at the at the higher level. They're at the organized crime, the uh, outlaw motorcycle gang type type uh, issues. What I'm talking about is what matters really in our communities. I'm talking about on our streets, at our beaches, at our walkways, parks where children play. But also uh, some news today, Terry, about questionable behavior by some officers. Mm. Yeah, well, that came up during the scrum afterwards. We asked him about uh, investigations that are underway, uh, and he confirmed today that three uh, officers are, uh, uh, have been assigned to restricted duties right now because of what he described as uh, some serious allegations. He wouldn't get into, into any details about what the nature of those allegations are, only to say that the uh, officers from the Ontario Provincial Police are uh, investigating. 
And uh, he's, you know, so this is on top of uh, a separate investigation by the Nova Scotia Serious Incident Response Team in relation to that uh, April 13th uh, uh, collision in St. John's that claimed the life of a 19-year-old woman. Hangs over the organization, it hangs over people that are involved. So we like to see these files done in an expedited way so that we don't have this cloud hanging over the organization, the members that are involved, or the persons that you know that came forward with the allegation. Right now the are allegations, we need to go through that process. We do have uh, resources from outside the province that are being used. So at this point I, I always suggest that we let the, uh, the investigation take its time. We'll deal with the reports when they come to us. Now, something a little unusual from the chief today. When we pressed him about these uh, independent investigations, he said he'd prefer to uh, do a live interview, uh, and we offered him a chance to do that on Here and Now tonight. He said he had another commitment, but that he could do so uh, tomorrow. Um, and as for plans to establish an independent oversight body here in the province to, uh, uh, you know, to over oversee the police in situations like this, a serious incident response team similar to what they have in Nova Scotia, well, Justice Minister Andrew Parsons says uh, it's a work in progress, and he expects to see some movement on that issue uh, this year. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Terry Roberts in St. John's. Well, some news now about pay phones. Yeah, what are those? <laughs> uh, if you can find one, believe it or not, it's going to cost you more to actually use one. Bell Alliant is raising the rate throughout Atlantic Canada from a quarter to 50 cents. The company says the last increase happened more than 20 years ago when it went up from a dime. And pay phone calls in most other provinces went to 50 cents a decade ago. Now this increase comes into effect on May the 28th. Bell doesn't say how many pay phones are left here but still has 50,000 of them in seven provinces. Now, when's the last time you used one of those? I think I had 45 RPM records. <laughs> it's been a long time. I can't remember even seeing one around. I guess no. I'm not looking for yeah. everybody with their cell phones. Well, well, just about everybody, I guess. Yep. Yeah. Well, Another story now. This is a nice story. And this is a good one. Mm. A good dog is lost, but not anymore. That's the happy outcome for the Witten family, whose dog disappeared in St. John's while they were vacationing in Jamaica. The entire Witten family, including their one-year-old Boston Terrier, and you'll see her now, Mary Margaret, that's the name. They visited the St. John's Morning Show today. Look at cutie. The family pet is actually a companion dog to 11-year-old Liam, who has Asperger's syndrome. Now, the dog got off leash and disappeared while out with a dog sitter near Mount Sio Road. So this is where social media does some good. The campaign was seen by thousands, including Cindy Witten, while she was still in the Caribbean with her family. So her husband, Scott, came home early to search for the missing animal. But it wasn't until mom and the kids came back that Mary Margaret was found in the woods. And it was very close to where she had first disappeared. She's so quiet, she doesn't bark very much. She's very low-key dog, and she's uh, one of Liam's and Keith's best friends. Yeah. She was over there, like she was far, but she heard us calling, and she was going like a bullet towards them. <laughs> what a nice ending. Now, uh, apparently Mary Margaret wouldn't come when others called her, and it was a massive search going on, but when Cindy, Liam, and Keith did it, out she came. Yeah, people she trusted. <laughs> After a controversial public battle, St. John's Pride is now mending fences with police. We are in favor of having the police in the parade this year. Uniformed officers are now welcome to march in this year's Pride Parade. We'll find out what changed coming up.
Turning now to our critical conditions series, tackling problems within the province's health care system. We begin with an issue many can relate to, the waiting game. Forget months, it can take years to see a specialist. Our Ramona Deering reports. Deborah Griffiths of Placentia is having a bad day, and that means pain. One of her problems is spinal stenosis. Griffiths needs to see an orthopedic back specialist. Last time I called, which was a few months ago, the lady told me, in addition to the two years I've already waited, I have two more years to wait, which will be four years. She's anxious to know if anything more can be done to help her condition. It's not just the pain, she can't work and she's missing out on activities with her grandchildren. Oh, I miss being me. I miss being who I was, and I want to get back there. Somehow, I want to get back there. Hello. Hi, how are, how are you? you? I'm good. How are you good. today? Very good, thank you. In Bay Bulls, family doctor Annette McCarthy chats with patients. I guess you just, uh, you need your medication refills today. McCarthy says wait times in several areas are a concern for GPs. For instance, it can take two years to see a neurologist. I just booked one for next week. And or two years to see a psychiatrist if it's not an emergency. McCarthy says it's a big problem and that she worries about her patients. They can have a delay in, in the diagnosis, a uh, delay in, in the treatment or condition. Um, it can also create a lot of um, anxiety and stress. In Placentia, Deborah Griffiths is tired of waiting. Oh, boys, open your eyes. There's no need for a four-year wait for anybody. Uh, we got a fixed system. She used to jog and cycle. Now she's just focused on trying to get her health back. And Ramona joins us in studio with more. Expecting to wait four years to see an orthopedic specialist. How does that compare with other stories you've been hearing, Ramona? Debbie, we've heard from a family with a toddler who has some serious health issues. Eastern Health gave the parents a list of approximate wait times for the child. So get this, 17 months to see a pediatrician, 14 to 19 months for speech language therapy, and two years to see a psychologist. And what else have you been hearing, Ramona? Debbie, people have been writing in to us at mystory@cbc.ca. Just one more example for you, a woman with arthritis. She's an urgent case. She has extreme muscle weakness. She's having difficulty swallowing. She's been waiting for a date for an appointment since last September. And Debbie, she still doesn't have it. So Ramona, uh, thanks so much for joining us with this this evening. Thank you, Debbie. Members of St. John's Pride hope to march alongside uniformed police officers in this year's Pride Parade. And that's a very different message than what we heard several months ago when the organization launched a public battle with the police. At that time, they were demanding an apology for the arrest of dozens of gay men. That happened during the Village Mall sex scandal in the early 1990s, and that apology was flatly denied. Today, that demand isn't on the table anymore. Here now is Carolyn Stokes is standing by live at RNC headquarters with uh, more on this. So, Carolyn, what changed? Well, Anthony, for starters, the entire board of directors of St. John's Pride, there's new blood in the ranks, and they say that demand for an apology back in March was made by one rogue member. And since then, a new board has been elected, a board that's now publicly extending an olive branch to police. Well, we went through a hard time. Uh, we have a new board, we have new members, new ideas. It's a fresh start for St. John's Pride, and they want to make one thing clear. We are in favor of having the police in the parade this year. Uniforms and all. Having officers there and showing support, showing diverse, showing, you know, inclusion that officers are there in uniform and, you know, provide safety to our community. It certainly doesn't hurt that the new co-chair, Paul Comden, works as a sheriff's officer, but he says a survey of members showed overwhelming support for the police. We're happy to accept them and as the survey showed in the community dialogue that uh, everybody was in favour for them. We would have showed up whatever way they wanted to show up to be honest with you, whatever, whatever they're comfortable with. I know there's a lot of work in some, you know, for some people with regards to that trust between police. 
That trust is a bigger challenge in cities like Toronto, where police are banned from marching in the Pride Parade. Chief Boland says he's grateful that level of tension doesn't exist in St. John's. I'm very fortunate here in Newfoundland. We have a very caring, kind community, and uh, I think that's what you see is that we're just welcoming. I think that's a representative of our force as well. So, yeah, there's absolutely uh, no friction between us and Pride. And uh, Chief Boland says he plans to meet with St. John's Pride sometime within the next week or so. And he's saying he's looking forward to marching in the Pride Parade himself this July, whether he dons his uniform or not. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Carolyn Stokes for Here and Now. And in a related story, the St. John's Pride Committee also invited students from the high school in Springdale to be the Grand Marshals in this summer's Pride Parade and... The students have accepted. The Gender Sexuality Alliance, which made a pitch to Springdale's Town Council for a rainbow crosswalk in support, says more than a dozen of its members will make the trip to St. John's. Here now's Garrett Barry spoke to four of the students today. Uh, well, it's definitely going to be exciting and something we're really looking forward to because, again, it's something that we're standing up for and we get to really show our faces this time and people are going to see us for what we're standing up for. I don't know, I don't think there's been a Grand Marshal before, has there? No, so that's really cool that we're going to be the first ones. <laughs> it's definitely inspiring. Yeah, so we wrote the letter to the town and we hadn't expected it to get such media recognition, let alone uh, such like national recognition from not only the province but the country. A lot of times as youth we hear that our voices aren't as important because we're young but what this thing has really taught us that we do have a voice and we can use it in the most positive way po as possible. It's been good to see the feedback that we've been getting and I've learned a lot of different things from all of this and it's been like a big life lesson for something positive. Although we didn't get a crosswalk ourselves, uh, I think we've really started the, or gotten six other ones in different towns and places like Loggy Bay, Outer Cove, Middle Cove, and Stephenville, and it's really inspiring. Although we didn't get one, we did start other ones. Yeah. Honestly, it makes me even more grateful to know that I have been part of starting this conversation. We're showing not only the students in our school that you can do anything if you put your mind to it, if you put the work into it, and you can start conversations that are needed and are wanted everywhere. It shows every youth in the province that you can do anything if you want, you really want it, you know? Well, the latest incident of backlash against the gay community happened in Middle Arm this week. Several parents there didn't want their children attending a presentation on inclusion and diversity that talked about gay rights. It was a presentation paid for by a provincial grant and sanctioned by the school board. So how is the school board responding? That interview is coming up in 10 minutes.
We have breaking news at this hour. Two forest fires are now burning on the island and threatening homes and cabins. The first is in Terra Nova, where a fire has already destroyed two cabins. It started at around 4 o'clock, and the blaze is now 50 hectares in size, and it's moving north. Away from the town of Terra Nova, water bombers are fighting that fire. The second fire is in Bristol's Hope near Harbor Grace, and it started about half an hour ago. Fire crews have evacuated nearby homes and closed the roads there, and there's a water bomber heading to that fire as well. We are chasing more details and putting info on our website, cbc.ca slash NL. A very scary situation yeah, for absolutely. many people, and of course the winds are high, which yeah. cannot be good trying to uh, fight this. No, definitely not. Uh, a couple of showers rolling down the northeast coast right now, uh, so that's a little bit of good news, but the winds are, are you know, uh, obviously the biggest concern right now. Uh, they're in from the southwest. Now, Terra Nova is not on this map, but very similar to the winds you're going to be seeing uh, at the Gander Station, which is sustained around 25 kilometers per hour in from the southwest and gusting to around 40, if not 50 kilometers per hour at times. Again, southwest winds mean that fire uh, will likely be spreading northeastward and that is uh, by the sounds of that report what is happening right now uh, with that situation we have temperatures around seven degrees winds are shifting by the way from southwest to north West as we roll throughout the evening into the overnight as the system departs again couple of spotty showers along the front that will be seeing that shift from southwest winds ahead of it to a bit more of a west northwesterly wind in behind and there's that wind shift through this evening as that frontal boundary comes through and it's going to be a bit on the breezy side again tomorrow unfortunately especially along that northeast coast, both in Harbor Grace and in the Terra Nova region. Now, temperatures are really going to drop tonight. We're talking about overnight lows in the minus six range for inland low-lying areas of central. And any early tent goers will really have to make sure they've got the, the warm sleeping bags out for tonight for sure. Minus 12 for Labrador City, so another very cool start there. Quiet is the name of the game tomorrow. Not ruling out another spotty shower or two central towards the northeast coast, an evening risk in St. John's, but it's about a 30% risk, so didn't even bother to put it on the icons here, but certainly the chance of an isolated shower is possible central towards the northeast into the afternoon. Temperatures are going to be cool in those onshore winds along the west coast. We won't muster up much more than three or four degrees from Cornerbrook to uh, Gross Morn, Baybrook Peninsula, even cooler for the northern peninsula in those onshore winds. Flurry chances, Labrador City into Happy Valley Goose Bay near the freezing mark or below once again. The nice looking Friday sails right into Saturday and the start of the long weekend is looking fantastic. Not only for Friday, but into Saturday as well. Little on the breezy side again with some gusts in the 50 kilometer per hour range. Temperatures are though are going to flirt with double digits across a good portion of Newfoundland and starting to recover in Labrador. Six, even seven degrees from central towards the west. Our next system will arrive as we roll through the Saturday night time period. Talking about some wet snow mixing in in Labrador, likely changing over to some rain showers into the afternoon. On the island, it's going to be that rain that's marching in from southwest to northeast, as I mentioned. And so uh, we will see temperatures still a little on the mild side, double digits. But again, it's in the morning arriving for Cornerbrook into the afternoon for Grand Falls, Windsor, Gander, likely around lunchtime by the looks of things right now. St. John's should stay dry until the mid to late afternoon uh, for the Avalon Peninsula region. So a good portion of Sunday will be dry. And in Labrador, again, it's those showers and flurries mixing in with temperatures rising as that uh, frontal boundary moves through. We'll talk about Monday and beyond with your long range coming up, Anthony. Thank you, Ryan. Now, back to one of our top stories tonight, a scathing review of central health, one that highlights what workers call a toxic work environment and a lack of vision from management. The report also highlights the tension between the hospital in Gander and the one in Grand Falls, Windsor. So, what is the health minister going to do with this information? I met up with John Hagee this afternoon at the Confederation Building. Well, this report only came out this afternoon, so I made a few notes to try to digest what I could. We're going to talk about some of the problems identified and some of the solutions. John Hagee is uh, with me right now. Uh, Dr. Hagee, the report says that there's nobody with a vision, that there's uh, leadership absent at all levels. What did you make of that finding? 
I mean, I think it speaks to uh, the, the, the difficulties that we've heard from the grassroots of how they feel frustrated when they have issues. They don't seem to or didn't seem to get guidance as to how to resolve problems. Uh, and I think uh, that was part of that cultural piece mm -hmm. that Dr. Vaughan had identified as being an issue within uh, central health. And one of the recurring themes in the report is also this rivalry, which seems intense, if not dysfunctional, between Gander and Grand Falls, Windsor. What, what's your assessment of that problem? I think a lot of that's perception. I mean, when I was there uh, uh, recently, uh, I think a lot of it is reciprocated. And I think it's just a lack of clear knowledge of what's going on across the region. And as much about communication as anything else, there has been a historical rivalry between the two communities, which has you know, been in sport and various other things. Uh, but I don't really know whether this is reflective of the way the communities feel truly about each other. But does it mean or suggest that one of the communities, namely Gander, deserves to have more resources allocated its way? Well, from my point of view, I, as minister, see a huge value in having both facilities uh, up and running, providing complementary services, providing backup for the other in, in case of issues. Because the central region geographically is the biggest geographic footprint uh, off Labrador of any of our RHAs. We, we need the resources of both. Right, the regional health authorities. Uh, the other finding before we talk about solutions that, that struck my eye is that managers were perceived to not be aware of their racial and gender bias, the managers. Um, what do we do about that? Well, I think that speaks to, to education, again, and training, uh, and uh, what qualifications and experience people have when they get promoted into managerial positions. Sometimes you can get thrust into situations uh, and, and learn on the job. Uh, it's nice if you can have some succession planning, and the port re report references that, whereby you can, you can groom people, you can train them, uh, so that anyone of the subordinates, if you like, would be able to step in uh, if a director or a VP uh, went away. Now, there's so many recommendations we could possibly touch on, on a lot of them, but what's, what's your thinking, Dr. Hagee, about what's really important to fix the situation in central health? A desire to fix it and an acknowledgement that what's in the report provides you with the material to do it. There's no problem that can't be solved if you apply yourself to it. Within that report, the recommendations break out into things for the department to do and we're gonna look at how we can implement those. It also breaks out into recommendations for the board, for the physicians and for the communities. Uh, and certainly the board will strike this uh, team uh, with uh, faculty from Memorial, uh, with uh, Dr. Vaughan advising it and some input from the department to, to steer those various elements. Final question for you. You are a surgeon. You have personal experience, career experience in the region. Was this allowed to fester too long? And I don't mean on your watch, but even before you actually got into politics. I mean, this, problems like this don't happen overnight. No, they don't. And I think uh, a lot of what has happened has been a challenge in trying to amalgamate two, uh, two cultures from different sides of the region uh, and some, uh, some difficulties with getting the right people in the right places earlier on. Dr. Hagee, thank you very much. Appreciate that. You're more than welcome, Anthony. Seal products were on display in the lobby of Confederation Building today. It's part of National Seal Products Day, which is officially May 20th. If you've never heard of it, that's probably because it's only the second annual event. The federal government officially recognizing it last year. The province says it is a way to celebrate the economic and cultural importance of the seal hunt. Vendors from around the province were part of today's event. Underneath here is a seal pelt and we have various patterns that we use like for example this purse so this would be cut right out of the pelt and then we bring in the leather as well and uh, make our products that way. We operate from the basement of our home uh, in Arts Content. Uh, we do craft fairs from the fall on, onward and uh, we travel right from uh, here in St. John's right to Corner Brook with our different craft fairs and things. Now the province says in 2017 over 80,000 seal were landed in the province and that's a 22% increase over the previous year and that generated $2 million and helped support 50 processing jobs. National Seal Products Day will be celebrated in Ottawa on Tuesday at the National Arts Centre. The rainbow flag is a symbol of inclusion for the LGBT community, flying proudly here outside of St. John's School. But some parents in Middle Arm kept their children out of a school presentation on inclusion issues. We'll hear from the school board next.
The English School District is responding today to the situation in Middle Arm. Parents of a number of students at MSB Regional Academy wouldn't allow their children to attend a presentation on LGBTQ and inclusion issues this week because of religious and moral concerns. The presentation was made by a national group called Get Real. They've traveled the country speaking with about 150,000 students. Our program is really, um, you know, about accepting one another, supporting one another, spreading kindness, uh, and learning that, you know, everyone is a little different. We all kind of have a story to share and a voice to be heard. Get Real was brought to the province through a provincial government grant, aligning with their safe and caring schools policy. Tony Stack is with the school district. Were you surprised at all that some of these parents decided to keep their children out of the Get Real presentation? Well, we've had Get Real going around central western Newfoundland now for a couple of weeks, and uh, we've had some very successful visits and some very positive feedback. Uh, I think the 13 students that did participate had a, a wonderful uh, uh, briefing and uh, participated well. Uh, yeah, it is unfortunate, but uh, you know we, we tend to go back again around. Uh, we got uh, a lot of this on the go now for the last five years or so, so there'll be other opportunities. Yeah, but did it take you by surprise? Uh, a little bit, yes. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, just part of our business. It's our routine business. We have a lot of groups coming in talking about various issues, um, and this is just how we do business. You know, we have a safe and, and caring schools policy, an inclusive environment. Every student uh, should attend school uh, feeling uh, respect and inclusion. So, uh, yeah, you know, it was, there was some surprise there, but... Uh, uh, you know, I'd like to focus on the fact that it was a successful visit, uh, some very positive feedback, and, and we're doing this in many, many schools around the province. You know, the parents who did decide to keep their students out of school for the presentation cited religious reasons. Is there any room for that these days in a non-denominational school system? Well, I don't view this at all as a religious issue. This is, a, is about respect. It's about inclusion. Um, you know, nobody is, uh, is telling anybody here how to live. Uh, this is really about uh, our students feeling accepted in the classroom and in our schools and in society in general. Uh, you know, I don't think uh, the school system has always gotten this right, uh, but uh, we learn and it would be completely unacceptable for us to know that there are students out there uh, who are, are feeling the stress and pressure. We know that, uh, that uh, bullying could be an issue and that uh, rates of, uh, of self-harm are higher. Uh, with respect to students that may have differences. And, you know, in this, in this modern society, in, in 2018, uh, we have to counter that, do everything we can to counter that. In hindsight, is there anything that the school board or the school could have done differently to prevent this backlash, basically, from some parents? I honestly don't think so. Uh, you know, respect and inclusion is highlighted in our strategic plan. We, uh, we speak to it often in all of our formal communication. And we've been doing this for some time, uh, and we will continue to do so. So, um, you know, we have other groups come in and talk about uh, empathy and inclusion, uh, Red Cross, the Office of the Child Youth Advocate. So this is just uh, part of uh, how we normally conduct our business. As you go forward, is there anything uh, else that you might do surrounding the Get Real presentations? Are, are you planning, for instance, to meet with some of these parents in Middle Arm? There's no plans uh, like that at, at this point. Uh, we, you know, Get Real will, will conclude fairly soon in the province, and, and they'll be back again in the Avalon in the region in the fall. Uh, and we'll promote it uh, just like we always do. And would you consider a uh, permission slip going home to families to notify them that these kinds of presentations will be happening? The uh, permission slips are normally used for outside field trips. This is uh, a sanctioned part of the curriculum. Uh, it aligns well with our, uh, our strategic plan, our safe and caring schools policy. So we wouldn't normally issue permission slips for something that's just part of, uh, of what we do. Tony Stack, thank you very much. Thank you. Parents and students staged a protest in central Newfoundland this morning. They're angry over a school board rule that will force some kids to either walk or get a ride to school. The long-standing 1.6-kilometer bus rule will be enforced in September. Around 60 people in Centerville, Wareham Trinity gathered outside the school. 
parents say it's not safe for their kids to walk to school because the town doesn't have sidewalks and crosswalks. One parent is even worried about students walking alone because of wildlife, such as coyotes. Parents are asking the board to look at towns on a case-by-case -case basis. Now stay with us. Ryan has your weekend forecast coming up. Time now to meet our young athlete of the day. This is Esme Lang from the Divers. Uh, Esme loves the winter and is a great downhill skier. And you may notice uh, from what she's wearing, she also enjoys skating and snowshoeing, and she would love to be part of the ski patrol for Marble Mountain when she gets a little older. Congratulations, you're today's young athlete of the day. So some very cool clouds uh, spotted over eastern Newfoundland uh, this afternoon. I was getting tons of pictures posted on Facebook and Twitter. And have a look. Some oh. awesome aspiritus clouds. Uh, turbulent atmosphere today. And so these are a little more wispy than typically we see uh, with these types of clouds. But uh, yeah, very cool pick. Uh, Jennifer Hillier snapped this over the metro region. They, Anthony? They clearly excite you. <laughs> they do. They do. I always get geared up for the Asperitas clouds. Uh, so thanks uh, for uh, showing them in. Only outdone by Mematis clouds. Uh, those are really cool as well. Uh, okay, I'm running out of time here. We've got a long weekend forecast to talk about. Uh, here's the low that's um, trucking through the region right now. Again, still some lingering showers, which hopefully will... Uh, throw a little bit more moisture on uh, some of those uh, forest fires that we're keeping an eye on Terra Nova and out towards the Harbor Grace region. So uh, that is now uh, going to be moving out throughout the overnight Friday and Saturday, both looking bright for the most part. We're talking about sunshine, high pressure dominating temps, a little bit cool, but not far from average. And then as we roll into the Sunday time period, watch your timeline Sunday morning, 
that rain pushing into Labrador with some snow mixing in and it's on the doorstep of southwestern Newfoundland then will push across the island Sunday afternoon into central. It looks like a mid to late afternoon arrival for St. John's and eastern Newfoundland that will push through and by Monday I think we're, we're pretty much done. Perhaps a lingering shower here on the back side of this low and possibility of a sprinkle or two if that low is a bit further north and so I do have a chance of showers in the mix for Monday but overall I think Monday is looking dry as well. Bit of a frontal trough coming through here into the Tuesday and Wednesday time period. That'll throw a few more showers into the mix for the uh, middle stages of next week. But overall, the forecast not looking too bad, especially for the weekend. We're going to be riding the double digit mark. And for you tenters out there, you brave, brave souls who tent on the May long weekend, we are talking about temperatures near the freezing mark. Uh, for both Friday night, Saturday night, and into Sunday night. So it's going to be uh, definitely the warm sleeping bag. I mean, it's May camping in Newfoundland. You definitely will want the warm sleeping bag uh, no matter what. Uh, and uh, the forecast will uh, put a uh, exclamation mark on that. Now for Tuesday, you can see temperatures back into the teens. That'd be awfully nice if we could get that on the weekend. Unfortunately not. And then in Labrador again, some snow mixing in for Saturday and into Sunday as that next system moves in and uh, far from normal again in terms of temps. Our viewer picture of the day. <laughs> there's Labrador. Only few, there's only, yeah, there's only a few places where we could <laughs> still find this scene. We'll be on it after the break. Sounds good. <laughs> All right, to view a picture of the daytime, and then we'll uh, we have an update on that uh, forest fire uh, situation. There is uh, the scene, which again you don't see too often this time of year. That's a lot of snow on the ground still. Big surprise, we go to Western Labrador, and uh, it is a beautiful it shot. Is. We're walking through spring slowly. The one nice thing about that is that the sun will be warm as they're walking through Definitely. on the face. And uh, right. I'm more excited to see it at the beginning of winter, though, not now. Right. We have a, yeah, a couple, little info. couple of sources about that fire in Terra Nova saying it started uh, near Red Barn past Eight Mile Bridge. Mm -hmm. Two cabins so far lost. So uh, check out our website for the latest on that. Of course, CBC News will cover that. CBC.ca slash NL. Also, I'm not going to be here tomorrow, so I'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs> I'm oh. doing a CBC <laughs> Investigates item on lobster uh, <laughs> next few days. So uh, I'll see you on Tuesday. Enjoy. Thank you. Enjoy tonight at the International the Film Festival. Thank you for reminding me. Fishing Festival. The I-4 <laughs> is easier to say. Thanks for being with us. Have a great night. See you tomorrow. Carolyn will be here with me.